Welcome everyone. My name is Tim Whitehouse. I'm the Executive Director of Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. Today's webinar is called Hair on Fire and Yes Packages, how the Biden EPA can reverse the chemical industry's influence. This event was to be moderated by Miles O'Brien, a veteran award-winning journalist who focuses on science, technology, aerospace, and the environment. Unfortunately, Miles is not feeling well today and sends us all his regrets that he cannot moderate this event. We are delighted, however, that David Abel is able to step in and moderate for Miles. An award-winning reporter and documentary filmmaker, David covers the environment for the Boston Globe. This is the second in a series of webinars that examine how risk assessments for new chemicals have been improperly altered to eliminate or minimize risk calculations, according to whistleblower complaints filed by Pierre to Congress and EPA's Inspector General. I will note before I turn it over to David, that David had no role in the language used to promote the webinar and in no way endorses Pierre's views. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to take part, and I really hope that Miles is on the mend soon. Uh, Pierre has played a really important role in helping journalists like me connect with whistleblowers over the years, and the series of articles that Sharon Lerner published this summer in The Intercept is an example of that. This afternoon, we have three panelists who are deeply immersed in these issues. The first is Kyla Bennett. Dr. Bennett is the Director of Science Policy at PEER. She'll discuss the recent whistleblower disclosures in The Intercept. The second panelist is Mindy Mesmer, co-founder of New Hampshire Science and Public Health and New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance. She'll discuss the impact of toxic chemicals on public health and how they've affected people and communities in her state. The third is Richard Dennison, the lead senior scientist at the, environment, at the Environmental Defense Fund. Dr. Dennison will discuss the industry's influence on the EPA and what, what might be done to curb that influence. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bennett and I will um, at the end ask a few questions and then we'll proceed to um, Mindy. Thank you, David. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about EPA, the agency that just can't say no. And if any of you out there are musical theater nerds like I am, you'll notice that that is from the musical Oklahoma. Um, EPA is just unable to say no when it comes to chemicals. So as a backdrop, I just wanna give you a little organizational information about which divisions at EPA we're talking about. The Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, OCSPP, is the major division under which new chemicals, which is where we're focusing, falls. Basically, there are three divisions under OCSPP, the Office of Program Support, which we're not gonna be talking about today, the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, OPPT, which includes the new chemicals division, existing chemicals, both risk assessment and risk management, and also data gathering and analysis. These disclosures that we've been making since July to the IG and to Congress have fallen primarily under the new chemicals division. Um, so keep that in mind. The way this works is the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA, is the act under which EPA risk assessors and toxicologists and chemists will try to assess the risk of a chemical. How risky is it to people, to the environment, they also look at things, risk management, which is how do we protect human health and the environment from these chemicals? And then also the third major division in OCSPP is the Office of Pesticide Programs, which I'm gonna to touch on briefly. Next slide, please. So how did PEER get involved? A little over a year ago in September of 2020, we were approached by four EPA scientists who worked in, they had all worked in new chemicals, all four of them. Three of them had been transferred out against their will to existing chemicals. One stays in new chemicals. Um, we also have clients uh, in the Office of Pesticides, and we've had new clients come forward since our first four brave clients have come out and made these disclosures. Next slide, please. 
So what have they disclosed? The first disclosure, which went to the IG and to Congress, um, what came out in July of 2021. And basically what these scientists told us was that managers and senior staff in the new chemicals division are altering risk assessments without the knowledge or approval of the risk assessors. Specifically, what the managers and senior staff are doing are deleting language that identify the potential adverse effects associated with a new chemical, including things like developmental toxicity, neurotoxicity, mutagenicity, or carcinogenicity. Some of these chemicals are really, really dangerous. They also alleged that these managers are reassigning risk assessments to inexperienced employees when the more experienced scientists are raising concerns. These inexperienced employees are doing what their managers are telling them to do, and these chemicals are getting on, out on the market without their risks being acknowledged. Next slide, please. Uh, in our second disclosure, which came out in August of this year, the clients went on to let us know that any time industry complained that their chemical wasn't getting out quick enough or wasn't getting out without restrictions, they would call managers of EPA, sometimes they would call their Congress people. And once they made these complaints, these chemicals were put into a category which the agency itself calls hair on fire cases that are then prioritized by managers for review. So this is a absolute case of the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Managers will take these hair on fire cases over and get them out as quickly as they can. They also allege that managers move back and forth between jobs at EPA and the chemical industry with very little conflict of interest scrutiny. In one case, we have a manager at EPA in um, this OPPT that went back and forth between the very industry he was regulating and EPA four times. This is unacceptable. They also said that EPA managers routinely use a 90-day review timeline, which is in TSCA, to intimidate staff into signing off on these assessments, even when there's insufficient data to come to a conclusion about the risk associated with these chemicals. Under TSCA, there's, they have a 90-day deadline to get these chemicals out. There is a provision in TSCA which allows them to reset that clock if there's insufficient information, but EPA managers are simply not letting these assessors use that. Next slide, please. In our last two disclosures, which came out in the month of September, um, we were exposing information about um, how the calculation of risks posed by hundreds of chemicals are being minimized. Specifically, since 1995, EPA has been operating under the assumption that there's an exposure threshold below which a chemical is safe. And therefore, release from a smokestack or from effluent into water or landfill leachate, was they were entitled uh, below modeling thresholds. And then managers told the assessors to start using the words expects to be negligible, negligible instead of below modeling thresholds, which has a whole different connotation. But a bunch of these, chem these uh, chemists went and reviewed the safety thresholds for about 368 chemicals that came out in 2020. And they found that more than half have the potential to cause risks, despite the fact that EPA was not even calculating these risks. So they were failing to calculate potential cancer risks to the general population. And they also said things like, well, it's probably going to get diluted in the air, so we're not going to have to worry. Dilution is not the solution to pollution. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, in the Office of Pesticides, um, Sharon Lerner did an excellent article calling it the Department of Yes. Um, EPA risk assessors are under intense pressure from industry. Um, they were told they felt like all they felt like all pesticides needed to pass the risk assessment and get out there. These employees are brought on crop tours. They're given barbecues. They walk into the lobby of EPA, and there are industry people there trying to be your friend. And what Sharon learned is that since 1974, which is very close to when EPA started, seven out of the nine directors of the Office of Pesticides went on to make money from the very companies that they used to regulate. The other two that didn't just retired. That's very disturbing. Next slide, please. They even celebrated wins for industries. This is an email from EPA from 2018, where they're saying, let's celebrate where we've now reached a thousand studies waived. These are studies that will protect human health and the environment. They waived these studies for industry. They even had cake. Next slide, please. 
they're not alone. In the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey for 2020, it was very clear that our four original clients and our new clients are not alone in this. Next slide, please. What we found is that when they were asked the question, I can disclose a suspected violation of a law, rule, or regulation without fear of reprisal, across EPA, 20% said no. But in the risk assessment division, it was 56.1%. That's a huge difference. Next slide, please. Also in the question, my organization's senior leaders maintain high standards of honesty and integrity, 64.6% .6 said no. That's appalling. Next slide. Considering everything, how satisfied are you with your organization? Under 20% negative review for EPA as a whole, but for uh, the risk assessment division, 58.2% negative. It's just appalling. Next slide. So given all of this, what is EPA doing? It seems to me and to other people at PEER that the Environmental Protection Agency forgot about the protection part. Next slide. And here's another quote from the song from Oklahoma. It's not that EPA doesn't know what the right thing to do is, they do know. We don't know why they're doing this, but we do know these following things. EPA is issuing meaningless statements. Every time Sharon Lerner comes out with an article, every time we do a disclosure, they recycle the same statement, which basically says, we take scientific integrity very seriously and we're gonna look into this. However, since we started making these disclosures in July, very little has changed at EPA and these problems persist. What we want them to do is to name names and hold these managers responsible. They should not be allowed to work in these divisions anymore. Also, it's worth pointing out that once chemicals are on the TSCA inventory, once they've been approved, it's very, very difficult to get them back, to get them out of the stream of commerce. So once they're approved, they are out there, they're harming the environment and they're harming public health. And this is of deep concern to our clients and to us. And finally, the most important point of all, we are all paying the price, not just from our health perspective, but also financially. Look, for example, at all the municipalities around the country who are having to spend millions of dollars to filter their water for just PFAS compounds. This is entirely EPA's fault. It can be fixed and we need them to stop playing games, to step up to the plate and to start fixing these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Um, so uh, you, you did in short order address uh, one of my first questions, but I wonder if you could be a little bit more expansive uh, about about what the EPA says in its defense and why, uh, you know, how, how they explain uh, these allegations and these emails and all of these findings. And the other question is, was this uh, more of an issue during the Trump administration or, or does it predate that? And by how much, how, how long does this go back? And what, if anything, can you tell us about uh, what the Biden administration and um, Michael Regan's EPA might be doing to address uh, uh, these findings? Um, thanks for those questions, David. Um, the, let me see if I can remember them all. Um, the EPA's statements are very broad and, and very general. They say science is back. Um, we will protect scientific integrity. We will protect these whistleblowers. They're saying all the right things, but there's no detail in there whatsoever. So we, very little has happened. Um, you know, we had we were cautiously optimistic that the Biden administration would be able to take the bull by the horns here and to really fix things. This problem absolutely did get worse under President Trump. There's no doubt about that. But the problem is much bigger than just the Trump administration. It happened in the Obama administration. It happened in the Bush administration. It happened in the Clinton administration. And it's continuing to happen in the Biden administration. And the first six months of the Biden administration, I was hopeful that they would start to make some serious changes here. We have not seen those yet. Um, I think Richard Dennison is going to be making some, um, in his talk in a few minutes, we'll be talking about um, things that can be done to fix these problems, but they are certainly not being fixed right now. Okay, great. We'll delve into that uh, a little bit more. Uh, Mindy, uh, why don't you uh, come in with your presentation? Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me. I am an environmental scientist, um, 
was uh, happy in uh, my consulting field for a very long time, 30 years, um, when I sort of got pulled into this issue in my own community. And some of the things that Kyla, um, the previous speaker, spoke about have really caused impacts in my, own, my very own community. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about this super fun site that's in my community. Um, and we can see how, regardless of what who was in control over history, over decades um, in the presidential seat, these things persisted, these same problems persisted over history. So I got involved in 2014. Um, there uh, was, as a scientist in my community, several moms started to reach out to me about kids getting cancer, these rare cancers. Uh, do you think there's an environmental issue in our town? And when I looked at the issue, I realized that there probably was. And so in 2014, I reported to the state cancer registry of my concerns about these children with these rare forms of cancer. And it took them two years to come back and determine that yes, uh, it was a cancer cluster, uh, two different rare forms of cancer that we think are environmentally triggered. There are children under the age of 20. Um, it was a certain time frame, but it spanned over a five town area of the seacoast here in New Hampshire. New Hampshire has got a beautiful seacoast. And if you just took a look at it, you wouldn't realize uh, of these underlying issues that are going on. I myself had just moved to the Rye town, uh, which I live now where the cancer cluster is situated. Um, I came from a town, neighboring town from Portsmouth where I lived for 25 years. And if you've heard the news, there's a big um, issue going on in Portsmouth with the Air Force Base that's contaminated the water supply in the, in the city of Portsmouth with their PFAS compounds that were mentioned by Kyla in the previous talk. These forever chemicals that never go away. Um, and this became the center of a lot of the work I've uh, continued to do here in New Hampshire. So in 2016, when the state came out and said, that it was a cancer cluster, I was very concerned because I know that's a very high bar to meet. There are very strict um, uh, criteria that we have to meet to be able to consider it a cancer cluster. And maybe some of the things we've heard about in the past where there are high rates of cancer actually don't even qualify. So I knew that this was a very dangerous situation going on. I also don't wanna lose sight of the fact that these are the children who talk about pediatric cancer as scientists, but these, they're actually children that are getting sick of these cancers. And here you can see uh, the children that I was aware of at the time who were impacted by this cancer cluster. Um, and in, in 2016, uh, these were the parents that were reaching out to me, my friends were reaching out to me about these children. Um, I was concerned because the state asked me to come as one of the people that, uh, that brought this to their attention. They asked me to come to our town library to talk about this. They wanted to sweep it under the rug. Um, and not talk about it in public. Um, I went away from that meeting after suggesting many things they could do to investigate this issue as an environmental consultant, environmental investigator. Uh, they said no to everything I suggested um, and they wanted to just hide it. So a few days later, I reported it anonymously to a newspaper in the area. And what happened was a series of meetings were set up, this one in my town, uh, when the media reports came out, um, parents were very fe uh, fearful, they were angry that they were not told. The state admitted that they could have done a better job and then the parents know what the issue was. Um, and at the time, Governor Hassan uh, set up a task force which I was asked to be on to investigate the environmental triggers for the cancers. As the task force got to work, we started to immediately look at this super fun site, which is geographically central to the um, cancer cluster here on the seacoast. It's called Copley Landfill Super Fun Site. Uh, it had been largely forgotten for decades. It was closed in the mid 1990s, uh, as far as the EPA was concerned. Um, however, we started to look at what had happened in the history of the site. Um, and what we found was very concerning. We found a history of illegal and legal dumping. We found the Air Force, the Navy, and hundreds of other um, chemical companies came up to New Hampshire, came from other parts of New Hampshire to dump in this dump. It's situated on the very highest part of the seacoast. It started as a rock quarry, where they quarried out the rock, it caused cracks to happen in the rock, and then they poured chemicals directly into that rock. And in the end, even after EPA closed the landfill in 1983, uh, the Air Force continued to put incinerator ash on top of the landfill. So now we're left with 50 feet thick layer of, the, of incinerator ash on top of the landfill over a 27 or 30 acre site and then a cap was put on top and it was left to simmer for um, decades until the task force started to look into it. When I started to look into the history of this site, I realized 
you got newspaper reports around the time, 1988, that um, you could just change the date on the newspaper uh, stories and maybe a few of the names and this, the problem still persisted. We tried to ask why we weren't having health studies done. There are concerns around the children uh, in the area as well as adults in our area with the high rates of cancer and other chronic disease. Um, and you know, the people at the time were saying, I thought the state was gonna help us and take care of us, but we were naive in, in that expectation. And that situation still persists today. I still ask all the time for a health study and we don't, we still have not gotten it. Um, and, and many of the people at the time said uh, this publication looked at how the EPA conduct, conducts those health studies, but they're set up to be inconclusive, that they didn't listen to the concerns of the residents. They never fully and adequately investigated the health concerns of the residents and they concluded there's no problem here. Um, we're on our way. When I started to peel away some of the layers, I noticed that um, the original decision EPA had made included not only putting a cover on top of the stump, but also included some active control of the toxins flowing away from the site and groundwater. Although that second part was never installed and I couldn't understand why the EPA actually went back on its decision uh, to put that active control, which would have helped prevent some of the things that we, I'm gonna talk about a little bit here from happening in the future. Um, and actually in preparation for this um, webinar, I put some uh, thought into this preparation and remembered that I had found uh, through my research, some evidence that there was something politically going on at the time that probably resulted in this um, active migration uh, not being installed. And that included pressure from sitting senators, Bob Smith and Doug Gregg at the time to EPA region one. And I, I realized that this was the same person that our previous um, talker, hat speaker had uh, sued, John de Villars, uh, in 1994 over the very same thing, caving to political pressure at the expense of public health and uh, legal issues. So very interesting to come across that in the last few days. Um, so decade late, decades later, we're starting to realize that the government and EPA has failed to protect us. Um, Things like that the, uh, the active control of the groundwater migrating that site was never installed. They also were never compelled to do further investigation in the bedrock. Remember I said they put chemicals directly with the chemicals directly into the bedrock. The investigation of that never occurred at the time. Uh, and now we're left with the task force uh, compelling sampling for PFAS because we knew the Air Force that has a big issue at P's Air Force Base also used this dump to dump their chemicals. Sure enough, we find really high levels of PFAS around uh, the dump in private and groundwater monitoring wells around the dump. Um, I also spent some time looking at, you know, the state's not very transparent about the cancer rates in our communities. Uh, you have to continue to keep trying to ask them for information. But what I could find uh, was very concerning because not only do we have this double cancer cluster on the seacoast, but New Hampshire has the highest rates of pediatric cancer in the nation. We also have the highest rates of breast, bladder, and um, esophageal cancer in the nation in New Hampshire. So kind of in contrast to this idyllic setting that appears um, to look like on the seacoast here in New Hampshire, we actually have some very underlying, very concerning issues. So as we continue to work on the task force, uh, tensions rose. There was a lot of back and forth between uh, pushing on the agencies to do something, the agencies pushing back, saying they didn't do anything. So we have this constant back and forth, which I'll go through here, um, about uh, trying to get people to do the right thing here. Um, the polluters were compelled to install treatment systems in two offsite wells, private wells off the site, um, but that was only after intense pressure on EPA to actually act, and they have not acted on many other issues that we found uh, through the work on the task force and later work. Um, we found very high levels of PFAS going directly into area streams. There are four streams that originate on the uh, western side of the Kofi Landfill Superfund dump. Uh, these PFAS chemicals are going directly into uh, those brooks and they run throughout the seacoast area, um, unbeknownst to the public um, who are being exposed to these on a daily basis, basically. Um, there are also uh, many other issues that we uncovered along the way. Uh, and um, the problem is that, you know, as um, our previous um, speaker talked about, 
the EPA hasn't acted and won't act if these chemicals, these PFAS chemicals, are not considered to be circular hazardous waste. So some of the things that are happening in Congress right now, uh, I hope are, we're hoping will will help with some of this stuff, but um, we don't see a lot of action, although it's been promised, to really control the migration of these chemicals. And basically what we're doing is, you know, these chemicals are put on the market um, and one by one, we have to prove that they're not safe. So it feels like we're playing whack and roll all the time. Uh, the state of New Hampshire actually made some great progress when I was an elected representative that we became one of the first states to regulate with very strict regulations for these PFAS chemicals, but we know that there are about 9,200 of these chemicals that exist now. So we're playing whack and roll to catch up with the chemical companies. Uh, so we had to press um, to find out what was going on. You know, I said in the beginning that uh, we were not uh, we were not privy to some of the information. So we actually took them to court in the Superior Court in New Hampshire, and we were able to um, make sure that the right to know law applied to this um, polluter group. Uh, we found information that let us know that you know a lot of things have happened in the past, including the fact that when they did not install that active control of migration they actually have to pay the government back $5 million at some point in the future out of taxpayer funds uh, in order to be, because they never installed that, that active measure. But we were concerned that people weren't being notified that this pollution was going on in our community. Uh, we tried to get EPA to enforce, uh, the, to compel the polluters to put up signs. They would not, so we did it ourselves, which then forced the hand of EPA to compel the uh, polluters to put these signs up to warn the public that they're um, being exposed to these chemicals in our surface water bodies across the sea coast. But this continues. Uh, we're lucky that we now have these meetings open to the public that the polluter group has. We listen to what they say, um, and their this isn't working. Uh, and their uh, the comments are very concerning. They talk about well, we tried and it didn't work, so we satisfied the condition of the law that um, required us to do something. We didn't, nobody said it had to work. Um, and uh, so here I am as a scientist with my hair on fire, worried about what's happening in my community. Um, I still every day am pushing for action um, and, and are worried that the state of New Hampshire along with the EPA regulators are not taking action to address this very important issue. The EPA continues to fail us. Um, I, told you about the incinerator ash that's on top of the landfill. No dioxin samples have ever been collected in the landfill, yet the EPA continues to, uh, to press to make sure that the polluters have to evaluate this group of, of chemicals. Uh, they refuse to do it. So it, it, it's very concerning that while um, we have this agency and the state agencies here to protect us, that they don't take a, a, an approach that's called precautionary to protect all of us. They actually protect the chemical companies who hide behind uh, the secrets of their uh, confidential business secrets um, to keep the information about the toxic threats of these chemicals that are already on the market that most municipalities don't even know are in the landfills that threaten public health. Um, and the EPA really deserves a lot of this blame for allowing this to happen and allowing you know, people in our communities to get sick as a result. Unbeknownst to them, uh, they find out decades later that um, the government has failed us. So that's about all I was going to talk about. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mindy. Um, so briefly, I have been interested to follow uh, some of these issues, especially with PFAS um, and New Hampshire, which typically uh, doesn't uh, take any uh, significant or aggressive environmental actions was at, at uh, the forefront in some ways of introducing regulations to try to reduce PFAS. Can you just say what the state has done, uh, whether you think it's sufficient or not, and what more you think the EPA should be doing? Yeah, so, you know, in the absence of EPA acting to prevent um, exposure to these chemicals and to come up with um, the risk assessments that prove that these are safe, um, the state took very aggressive action. I was an elected, I was elected to the state house here in New Hampshire in 2016, and I would, went there specifically to create science-based policy to protect our communities from things like PFAS. So 
the bills that I wrote um, actually did pass and they did get signed into law. They had great bipartisan support. Um, so the state does act um, in uh, because of that. Now we, this session, we're also introducing some more legislation that I've written to uh, address surface water discharges of PFAS. Um, the discharges that happen into those streams um, and rivers around Hopi landfill and many other places in New Hampshire, including the Merrimack River. Uh, but this is, like I said, a whack-a-mole approach. We're having to respond one by one, proving that these chemicals are safe or are not safe to be exposed to uh, one by one. So it takes a very long time. And those laws and regulations won't pass unless there's sufficient peer-reviewed science to back up the regulation of those chemicals. It's entirely uh, 180 degrees from where it should be. EPA should be um, acting on our behalf to, as a precautionary approach to protect us from exposure to these chemicals before we get exposed to them while they're conducting these health studies and then coming up with um, enforceable regulations on the federal level that we can then follow. Um, it's entirely backwards. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll pick up on the larger question of what, uh, what federal regulations should look like and how they could actually make it less of a whack-a-mole by state. But let's turn to Richard uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have been closely tracking EPA's new chemicals program for many years. Reluctantly, I've come to the conclusion that the program does not serve the agency's mission or the public interest, but rather the interests of the chemical industry. Despite the major reforms Congress made to the program in 2016, when it overhauled the Toxic Substances Control Act, it is so badly broken that nothing less than a total reset can fix the problems. Responses at EDF finally received to a FOIA request that we made two years ago, and the disclosures of the courageous whistleblowers we're hearing about today um, confirm what I have long suspected, looking in from the outside. The program, let me advance my slides here. <clears throat> There we go. The program uses practices that allow the chemical industry easy access and sway over EPA reviews and decisions on the very same chemicals they are seeking to bring to market. It has developed a deeply embedded culture of secrecy that blocks public scrutiny and accountability. It employs practices and policies often unwritten that undermine Congress's major reforms to the law and reflect only an industry viewpoint. And it operates through a management system and managers, some still in place, that regularly prioritize industry demands for quick decisions over the best science and health protections for workers and the public. Now, many of the, abu the worst abuses did occur under the, top of the Trump administration. And it's tempting to believe that the change in administrations fixed the problems. It has not. The damaging practices, culture, policies, and management systems predate the last administration, and they laid the foundation for the abuses. And highly problematic decisions continue to be made even in recent weeks. I am very encouraged by the recent statements and actions of Dr. Michal Friedhoff, Assistant Administrator of the Office that oversees TOSCA implementation. They clearly move in the right direction. But the deep-rooted systemic nature of the problem must be forthrightly acknowledged and forcefully addressed. Let me provide a few examples of each of the problems that I just noted. First, industry access. <clears throat> EPA regularly shares with companies drafts of the hazard exposure and risk assessments it develops when reviewing one of their new chemicals. And it allows them to dispute findings that they don't like. When the company's lawyers don't like the EPA scientists' response to those complaints, they simply elevate the issue to higher ups. One document we got from our FOIA is this one. It's an email exchange between then EPA chemicals office head, 
Alexandra Dunn, and the chemical industry lawyer, Len Bergeson. Bergeson complains about EPA redoing an assessment for one of her client's chemicals. She's concerned that the firm, her firm does not yet have the updated assessments and uh, that the revised draft assessment is not yet forthcoming. Note the word yet, uh, which indicates that indeed the earlier versions of those documents had been forthcoming. And then she alerts Ms. Dunn that, quote, we may need to elevate this case. Now, this example illustrates that the dr draft documents had been shared with the industry law firm, that they had a clear expectation they would be seeing additional versions of those documents, and that it was willing and able to protest anything they didn't like all the way to the top. The whistleblowers describe in detail how this industry access was institutionalized. EPA managers labeled these cases where a company objected as hair on fire. They elevated them to managers to resolve, and they pressured scientists to water down or remove concerns that the companies were objecting to. I ask you, in what universe is it acceptable that the very entities EPA is supposed to be regulating are allowed such influence? The conflict of interest could not be more blatant. Second, the program's culture of secrecy. In the last webinar, I spoke about the way this program works behind closed doors, bilaterally between the EPA and the industry. Um, and that locks the public out of the room. EPA also locks out the public by not providing timely access to information that companies are giving them on their new chemicals or to the reviews that EPA is conducting. And even when those documents are provided, they are so heavily redacted to remove confidential information that they're indecipherable. Um, and while TSCA does allow for CBI, EPA allows companies to redact health and safety information that TSCA does not allow to be masked. This summer, EPA posted some documents on a PFAS chemical that a company was seeking to expand the use of. Included in the documents is a safety data sheet. Um, the company submitted a completely redacted version of that document, despite the fact that it is the poster child for health and safety information that must be disclosed. Uh, here is the document. It literally comprises one page with a single word on it, sanitized. The same for the substantiation document that the company submitted. It is supposed to explain why it redacted that safety data sheet. And again, here's the document that was submitted, a single page, uh, completely redacted. So the public doesn't even get to know why the company believes it can withhold this information from the public. EPA should have immediately declared this company's application invalid and rejected it. And instead they accepted it, started the clock running on their review, even though the public did not have access to even the most basic health information about this chemical. I mentioned that there are policies in place that are contrary to the amended law. Let me just briefly mention two. Uh, one of the major challenges or changes that Congress made to the law was that when a company does not provide enough information on its chemical, that chemical cannot simply slip into commerce because of the lack of that information. Before the reforms, EPA did that all the time. They simply let chemicals under the market because they didn't have any information that raised a red flag. The law was supposed to change that. Unfortunately, we see this being systematically thwarted. It has been years since EPA imposed any testing requirements on any new chemical. Several years ago, EPA stopped telling the public when its scientists found that the information was insufficient on the chemical. And when we asked that they restore that practice, they said they no longer make those calls. The whistleblowers have disclosed that managers have made it all but impossible for EPA scientists to make that insufficient information finding, no matter how little information they have. Instead, those new chemicals 
get onto the market just the way they did before the law was updated. Avoiding testing at all costs, which is a huge industry priority, has become a de facto EPA policy. Companies have quickly learned that they don't need to provide information because they can expect to get approval of their new chemicals without doing it. We were also shocked recently to learn of another de facto policy on new chemicals. EPA issued this summer a not likely to present an unreasonable risk determination for two, two new chemicals. And these determinations contain the exact same language that the prior administration used hundreds of times to dismiss occupational risks. EPA simply assumes that workers will wear personal protective equipment, despite the fact their employers are not required to even provide it. These very recent decisions that allow these chemicals into commerce without condition directly contradict EPA's announcement that it is reversing this policy. When we asked about it, we learned some even more disturbing things. EPA categorically assumes that the chemicals that cause irritation to eyes or skin do not present an unreasonable risk. Why? EPA assumes that workers will self-limit their exposure in order to avoid the effect. And on that basis, they assume workers will always wear personal protective equipment. Now I've heard the chemical industry make that self-serving argument for decades. Workers will simply protect themselves. But I was stunned to hear it come from senior EPA career staff. I asked whether these policies are written down anywhere. I was told no. I asked whether EPA had discussed those positions with anyone from the labor community. I got no response labor would have a very different perspective on this ability of workers to always protect themselves. I believe it is the insularity, insularity of this program where staff only interact with the industry and there's no engagement with other stakeholders that spawns and perpetuates these industry-friendly and unhealth protective policies. Lastly, a management structure has emerged that we've heard a lot about from the whistleblowers that rewards speed over all else. The whistleblowers have documented that the program prioritizes and rewards staff performance based only on the number and speed of completion of new chemical reviews. Lacking are any metrics that reflect the primary purpose of TSCA and the mission of the agency to protect health and the environment. So what is to be done? In my remarks last time, I offered some initial recommendations and they're on this slide. I'm not gonna go through them in detail. They're up on our website, but I do wanna go through a few additional recommendations. First, EPA should immediately cease sharing the risk assessments and these other documents with companies or their representatives. They have a conflict of interest that means that they should not have a role in deciding what those risk assessments say. Second, EPA needs to declare invalid any new chemical application that redacts health and safety information and not start the clock ticking on its review until and unless the public has access to all of the information it's entitled to. Third, EPA needs to restore the ability of scientists across the EPA to consult with each other when they are facing scientific issues in a new chemical review. If confidential information is a challenge in that case, EPA needs to find a solution to that so, so that scientists can share the information they need. EPA needs to comply immediately with the mandate that when there is insufficient information about a new chemical, that itself, it requires the imposition of testing requirements or other restrictions on that chemical. EPA needs to rescind this de facto policy that I described that dismisses all irritation risks to workers. Um, and it needs to fully implement the reversal it's already announced it was going to make. It erroneously assumes that employees are going to, employers will provide and employees will always be able to wear protective equipment. 
metrics are sorely needed that reward something other than just the speed of a review and ensure that uh, reviewers are rewarded for preventing risky chemicals from getting into commerce or imposing the needed testing and, and other restrictions to ensure their risks are mitigated. Finally, EPA needs a process that is conflict of interest free to mediate uh, scientific disputes that arise in the reviews of new chemicals. That should be drawn from independent scientists within the agency, but not in the, the office that runs this program, as well as independent scientists outside of the agency who have no ties to the industry. Thank you very much. If you want to read more about our views on new chemicals, this is where the blog posts we've done on this over the years uh, reside. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so. Uh, before I ask you a question, I just want to say, uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A now. Uh, I do see that there have been a number of questions. Uh, many of them have received answers. Uh, but if you have specific questions that you would like me directly to address to the panel, please uh, post them now in the Q&A. Um, but Richard, I, I just wanted to ask um, some questions from a kind of devil's advocate point of view. There's obviously mm -hmm. no one on this panel uh, from the chemical industry. And I, I just wanted to ask you to respond to sort of their due process concerns and wh what role you think is reasonable for the chemical industry to play in these decisions? How should they be involved? Um, what say should they have, if any, in uh, responding to government concerns about their, their products. Um, so why don't you start with that? Sure, well, um, it's one thing to understand what the concerns are that the agency has raised and to respond in, um, in terms of what uh, additional uh, conditions on the manufacture or the distribution or the use of a chemical would take those concerns away. Um, and I think that kind of exchange is necessary. Um, but for the agency to allow the company to mess with the science here and to alter or to strongly uh, lobby the agency using inside access to alter the conclusions of the scientists about their own chemicals is just an inherent conflict of interest. To the extent that EPA believes that there needs to be an, an exchange around the science on these issues, then that needs to be an open process. The public needs to have access to that process as well. And you know, many processes for developing assessments or, or rules work that way. It's an open process, all stakeholders have access to it. But this closed door negotiation and back and forth uh, between only the industry and EPA is, is really unacceptable. Uh, thank you, and I, I just wanna throw that question open to Kyla and Mindy. Uh, what do you think is a reasonable role uh, in this kind of uh, exchange where a chemical company produces a product that they think is important for something uh, and it has to go through, has to be vetted by the government? What role should they have in terms of uh, being part of the process? Um, what's, what's, the, what's a reasonable line before it would be crossed, um, David, I can take a stab at that. I, I don't, I don't mind um, certain type of industry access. For example, when I worked at EPA under the wetlands program, when somebody had a, a big permit application coming forward, they would come to what we called a pre-application meeting, where they met with the Corps of Engineers and EPA and Fish and Wildlife Service, and we talked about it before they even applied to try to flag issues for them that we thought would be problematic. You know, in this case, because we've got this statutory 90 day deadline under which these risk assessors theoretically have to make a decision. I mean, they don't, they can say there's insufficient information but they're not allowed to. Um, I think it's really important that the industry make sure that they bring forward to EPA risk assessors all the information that they need to make a science-based risk assessment. These, um, 
Risk assessors are often only given the name of the chemical and an abstract from an industry paper. So contrary to what the public might think, EPA isn't the one. They aren't there in a lab testing these chemicals to assess their, their risk. What they're doing is they're looking at industry chemistry, industry studies, and anything else that might be out in the public domain from academia or other scientists. So sometimes there's nothing out there on these chemicals. And so I think the role, the, the best role for industry would be to have some kind of pre-application meeting where they come forward and say, this is what we have, this is what we want to do. Tell us what we need to provide to you so you can make a good risk assessment. That would be fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever, but that's not happening. Mindy? Yeah, you know, I appreciate um, certainly what both Kyla and Richard said uh, being very valid points. And, and one of the problems is, um, you know, there was a big uh, documentary um, and then called The Devil We Know, then followed by uh, Dark Waters that came out um, in the last couple of years on uh, Rob Bellat's work uncovering what happened um, when DuPont in particular withheld lots of um, health studies and information about the health effects of PFAS chemicals from the regulators and in some cases, and certainly from the public. So I think Richard's comments on transparency um, around uh, you know, what's happening within those um, agencies and, and um, that approve these chemicals is really important. The public deserves to know what's happening, but also this revolving door policy is very dangerous and has caused things like PFAS chemicals to be allowed to be put on the market without us understanding fully or the regulators what the health effects are from these chemicals. So it's, a, it's very, those two things, transparency and lobbying efforts um, and a revolving door policy are very important issues to get around and to understand how effective, how they're really impacting this process. I, I wanna turn the conversation to something more concrete, PFAS and how these issues play out with that. But be, before, we, before we get there, I just want you to each underscore maybe three bullet points about what would improve this situation um, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, accountability, uh, in how chemicals uh, get approved. And should this be, is this something that can be done just by uh, uh, EPA refining its procedures, or do you think it needs to be codified in law? Um, do we need, um, you know, a, a, a bill that's, that is passed and signed by the president? And just, so why don't, uh, we'll start Richard, uh, Kyla, and then Mindy. Uh, just what are three things that you think uh, would improve this process? So um, access of the public early in the process to the documents that are being submitted by the company um, and the documents being generated by EPA with the only things being redacted being those allowed under the law. Believe it or not, David, EPA's regulations predating the Tosca reforms in 2016 already required public access to that information and EPA simply wasn't doing it. After years of pushing on them, they are beginning to get there. But the, the redactions I described are a huge problem. The public also needs to have the ability to weigh in on these chemicals. And I understand there's a 90 day deadline. So that's all the more reason why the data need to be provided upfront before the clock starts ticking. Then allow EPA, allow the public a short period of time, 30 days is what we recommend for input on these chemicals to the extent they wish to weigh in and enough time for the agency to consider those comments before they make a decision. Instead, we see this stuff, the decision's already been made before we have access to any of the information. Just in the interest of time, we have five minutes left. Yeah. So let's just keep uh, uh, the bullet point answers essentially so we can talk about PFAS. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with what Richard said. We need, uh, again, I, I don't think there need to answer your question directly, David, I don't think we need um, a new statute or new regulations. I think we can do, we can make many of these changes under existing law and policy, starting with replacing the managers that are causing the problems. That's my number one problem right now. This is a culture issue. We need to replace people, get some of those people out of there. We need to 
get rid of that 90 day clock, not statutorily, but by having pre-application meetings and we need more transparency and to get rid of this overly liberal use of CBI. I would just yeah. one question about that. It just seems like if you have a new administration that doesn't have these values without some codification in law, uh, the process could easily be changed um, and be abused uh, and maybe even worse than it is now. Go ahead, Mindy. I would agree wholeheartedly with the comments by, uh, by Richard and Kyla. Um, you know, it's all about how the public that has access to the information where it's published, but also um, an informed public that can then advocate for the rest of us. So it's all part of making sure that we all understand what's going on, making sure there are clear uh, document repositories so the public can access, and then the, the, the public being able to uh, input in the process. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to turn to something a bit more concrete, uh, um, we have learned in recent years just about the increased prevalence of the so-called forever chemicals, PFAS, uh, and how they're turning up uh, in our drinking water uh, in, um, or in our groundwater in ways that are concerning and many, many other things. So maybe um, you guys can say what you want to see the EPA do and what maybe we need in terms of federal law and where this is going. Uh, maybe Kyla, you start. Yeah, um, actually, just so you know, some of the chemicals that our clients have brought forward are indeed PFAS chemicals. So um, as uh, both Richard and Mindy said, we're playing whack-a-mole with these PFAS chemicals. There are these regrettable substitutions. Um, these, I've never met a PFAS that I liked. Um, some are less toxic than others, but they're they're all persistent. Most of them are toxic, and they most of them bioaccumulate. We have to we have to turn off the tap, and they have to be regulated as a class. That's one thing that EPA has been really really slow to do. They've been slow walking all of this PFAS stuff, but they really need to regulate PFAS as a class, and they need to use the precautionary principle in doing so. Richard, um, I would agree with that. Um, turning off the tap, uh, we are still seeing a, a significant number of new chemical applications involving PFAS chemicals. EPA has started to take some good steps. They are limiting the ability of those PFAS chemicals to go through a really fast, even faster review of 30 days. We think that should be a categorical prohibition, though, on those chemicals getting uh, through the process through exemptions from a more thorough review. Um, but there should be a very high bar for bringing any, any new PFAS to market. Mindy? I agree with the class, um, structural class uh, issue. Also, the, the one thing that would really help, you know, many of the PFAS uh, releases of help are coming um, in these bases across the United States that are DOD bases. Uh, so we need EPA to act. We need it to be a circle of this hazardous waste so they have the tools they need to be able to take action on sites like the one I mentioned in the beginning in my own community. Um, and we need EPA to act to create enforceable standards. I think the last one that they uh, um, did was TCE in 1996. We haven't done anything um, with respect to any of these other chemicals in terms of enforceable standards since then. The last thing I would like to talk about was uh, recently, just very recently last week, people are starting to talk about the contribution of PFAS chemicals to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they are very powerful greenhouse gases. Uh, the, the companies that emit these PFAS chemicals, uh, like ones in Merrimack, New Hampshire, they also emit gases that you know, are very um, powerful greenhouse gases. They, there's no reason to expect that they're gonna go away when they hit the atmosphere. They stay in our bodies, they stay in the env environment uh, forever, pretty much. It's either called PFAS you know, forever chemicals. Uh, they're showing up in places where there are no industrial sources of um, PFAS, like in the Arctic and the polar bear. So clearly they're migrating in the atmosphere. Um, we need to really look at their contribution to um, climate change. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time uh, as this conversation seems like it's only getting started. Um, thank you uh, so much. Uh, for your insight and uh, for your wisdom. And I appreciate it. Uh, it's been informative for me and I hope it was for 
uh, everyone else listening in. So uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. Tim, I don't know if you want to say a closing word, but uh, otherwise, thank you all for uh, joining us. Great. Yes. Thank you, David, for joining us at the last moment and panelists for a very interesting discussion. Just a reminder, we will send out an email to everyone that's registered with contact information for all the panelists, as well as a link to the YouTube video for this. And please contact us if you have any questions that we were not able to answer. This is the beginning of a discussion. We will have uh, future webinars on this issue uh, in the next few months. Thank you.